Hi, everybody that's out there. Uh, this is Mark Doolin. I am in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm talking to my friend Toby Oft, who is the principal trombone of the Boston Symphony. And Toby has been principal trombone there since 2008. Uh, prior to that, he had positions with the San Diego Symphony, Buffalo Philharmonic, uh, Sam Sarasota Symphony, formerly the Florida West Coast Symphony, um, as well as you played a little bit in Zurich and the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. Well, so well traveled, and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, in, in point of fact, I will say like because I think it is a, a matter of distinction if you like won an audition or not. I, I didn't ever win an audition in, in Zurich or Buffalo or or Liverpool. These were like trials or like one year positions. But in point of fact, I won Northwest Indiana, Sarasota, San Diego, and then Buffalo. Um, yeah. I think that that's significant, and I, I would hate to, you know, like, for example, Jonathan, you know, won principal trombone of the Buffalo Philharmonic, and, you know, that's it's not the same thing. Right, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, I, so. it's been a long time since I won anything, but I kind of remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <I know the laughs> so, <few. laughs> so um, but what I wanted to talk to you about to start with, before we kind of get to where things are now, is sort of like your beginnings. I mean, you, you started pretty young with your dad, who's a trombone player, right? That's fair, yeah. I started when I was six, yeah. six years old. Um, I mean, it, I don't know if it was a really helpful thing, I, but I did. Um, I think that the learning to practice when you're that young, you you learn that you can be the architect of your own success. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a tremendous gift to to give a kid. Uh, you know, like when you're young, the only other place that you could learn that would maybe be sports. That is to say, through your own ambition and industry, your discipline and consistent practice, you can be the architect of your own improvement. Uh, not because, you know, something was given to you or, or even that you had the right coach. It's literally because of your own industry. And that's a tremendous gift to give a kid. And I think that's the, the I, I've been thinking a lot, you know, because we have a lot of this sort of downtime, you know, what is the value of what we do? Right. And I believe that this one thing is one of the most significant, if not the most significant thing that we can offer as educators to young people uh, to, you know, strategies for them to realize their own success. Essentially, when I was six, I became addicted to what practice can do and sort of like applying that to as much of my life as I could. Um, I, I'm not trying to say that everybody should start when they're six, uh, but that was what I it, it, it created a culture for me for the rest of my life. Now, so when you were six and you were, you were practicing a lot when you were six. Yeah. Like when you say a lot at that age, what, what, what kind of time frame would you say? Well, <laughs> my parents paid me to practice. I will say that they gave me a dollar an hour because I wanted to buy my own gum. They would not buy me gum at the store, but they said, um, they pay me a dollar an hour to practice. So it started out like a half hour a day and then a couple of weeks went by and I realized that I could practice more than once in a day. Uh, we started this summer and I started practicing two hours a day. And that was when my parents stopped paying me. Uh, <laughs> 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 like, you know, clearly we don't need to pay you to practice anymore. And I think, you know, in, in point of fact, that's, that's actually the, what you want for all your students. Um, I, I keep thinking about, all I'm thinking about right now is just like, trying to motivate kids to practice, you know, when it, when it becomes that um, sort of self-perpetuating process, then a teacher can kind of just like make sure that the, the hungry kid always has something to eat. Right. You know, the, as far as like offering them uh, exercise, that's, that's where I was. It was just Arbens and Long Tones and Bordonis. Wow. Even Bordonis that young. Were you, uh, what, there must've been music around the house, obviously. What, you know, for you to be practicing, yeah. what, what was it that kind of captured your imagination at the beginning? Well, my dad played trombone. This is a luxury that a lot of kids don't have. My dad played Tommy Dorsey ballads on the porch every night. And he also taught private lessons. He was a music educator, uh, he taught beginning band. And uh, he would then practice on his own afterwards. And it was just kind of a, a cool thing to participate in. Uh, and as soon as I could, I started playing Tommy Dorsey as well. And um, that, so it was essentially, I had a live um, example to follow. Um, so 
but it was not classical in nature. It was more jazz focused. And in fact, I was a jazz trombone player until I finished high school. And I switched to classical when I got to college. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that was, the, <laughs> I'm not sure if that was the right way to go. I remember thinking that, that if I could win an orchestra job, it would be more stable. Um, I'm not sure if that's accurate uh, anymore, at least. And then uh, I also, I, I really like hearing strings. Um, I really enjoy hearing a string orchestra, the, the fullness, the richness of the sound. Uh, it grabbed me, and I, so I, I chose to follow that. But I was, I've, I've always been irritated that the trombones don't do more in the orchestra, to be honest. Right. And were you... Um, but that's that's kind of great that you're doing that in the beginning because you were playing from a very vocal point of view if you're doing that in the beginning, right? Yeah, I was playing, you know, I think it's really important to begin with a model, always have an ideal sound that you're going for. Um, so, uh, you know, Tommy Dorsey's, his phrasing is particularly vocal and there's always a, a sustain, like a vocal sustain. You're right, that's a good way to put it. Uh, and that's exactly what I would tell kids. Uh, even now, that you're working on Tuba Miram I, or um, Charlier. It's just like, where's that linear sustain coming from, that breath support? It usually comes from that interesting phrase structure, which is prevalent in Tommy Dorsey. Right. Um, yeah. And then Yeah, I think, like, you know, this is all about kind of tangents. And so I will say that uh, I've noticed uh, when people focus on the process a lot, this, after a certain amount of time, like at, at the beginning, you focus on the process and everything gets a lot better. But if you focus on that, like it's the most important thing, the process, the methodology, oftentimes the physicality, trying to control your physicality, everything kind of implodes. The sound kind of gets one dimensional and kind of crushes in on itself. Or it could be articulation. For trombones, it's often slide technique. You'll pe see people moving the slide with a sort of muscular arm just trying to be accurate. And there was, you know, there's a reason why they're trying to be accurate. They're trying to like remove scoops and smears, you know, you're trumpet, you're trying to get the, you know, trombone as well, you're trying to get that perfect embouchure. Even breath support, you know, you can overdo that to the point with your concentration that, that the vocal cantabile just leaves, leaves the whole process. Well, with that in mind, and you mentioned slide technique, I'm wondering if there's anything that you see um, students doing like young students or there, as you think back about yourself as a young student that maybe people overlook sometimes with like slide technique or some of the more trombone centric kinds of things uh it's complicated it's a it's a good question and for our trombone players in the audience i think it's really helpful to consider but um it has to do with the rhythmic um synchronicity of technique okay so um when we're talking about better slide technique, uh, we're talking about arriving to the note with the correct slide position in rhythm. And if it's early or late, we'll oftentimes hear a scoop or a smear. Uh, and the reason that this is significant is because there's technique that happens, like if you're going over a partial, right, mm -hmm. or you're articulating, if this isn't rhythmically synchronized, right, we'll hear uh, problems that have nothing to do with the slide actually manifest in scoops and smears, right? Uh, oftentimes the slide technique is fine. In fact, what we want is easy clarity. Uh, when you're, if you articulate early or late or sort of lugubriously with the tongue, oftentimes you'll hear a scoop and a smear. If the, if the transition point, like the, when you do that little flick to get you over two partials, mm -hmm. uh, if you do that early or late, you'll hear a scoop and a smear. And it has nothing to do with the slide being out of sync. It has to do with the technique being out of sync. So I think that, uh, I mean, that's a good question. And it comes down to a clarity of rhythm that is evident in all the matters of technique besides the slide. Uh, so frequently people will try to solve a problem with a muscular slide arm or a muscular tongue, trying to make up for a gap in the synchronized breath you know, the arrival of the breath or the arrival of the tongue or the arrival of the, the flick of the lips uh, or the even the, you know, the slide could be out of sync. But, you know, all of these things have to be rhythmically congruent with each other, right? And, and so, um, you know, this is an example 
of if you have the sound product in your mind first of what you want to sound like, a lot of times your brain will figure these things out for you. But if you try to relegate it to only the slide, oftentimes that overlooks or completely divorces you from, from finding the correct solution with your lips, with your tongue, with your breath support. Is, is there, and, and so because of all those things, I mean, I notice sometimes on the trumpet that we have, um, there are little things like even the way people hold the instrument, you know, sometimes, right, you know, sometimes the way the instrument's held or where some of those partials lay that you were just talking about that maybe don't have anything to do with maybe the finger technique, but it's where it lays on the horn is uh. how would you, could you like show like a, what you think of as an ideal hand position just for like, Oh, for the for trombone, <laughs> for, the yeah. trombone or? for the trombone, not the trumpet, of course, Trumpet's uh. probably in the case. Okay. Um, well, okay. So if I'm, if I'm like this, God, I never really think about this, but I guess I'm asking, okay. because sometimes when I work well, with, what my... if I, what if I said it like this? Because you know, everybody's body is different. Mm -hmm. And I hate to come up with an overly simplified solution that might carry somebody to a place where it's incorrect, right? right. So uh, the way it was explained to me best was that, you know, you should stand, um, I, I swear to God, I think, Steve, I think you told me about this once. Imagine like you've got a, uh, like somebody sutured a string to your scalp and is slightly lifting on it and you, you need to lift your body slightly to just make sure that there's slack on the string, right? I really like this and uh, nice. <laughs> uh, I really like this analogy because, uh, and this is something that Tom Rawls told me about breathing, uh, that as you exhale, you should be stretching your body long, right? Because typically we will breathe in the reverse. We'll, we'll inhale and this becomes our breathing, right? Um, but if you think about your, your breathing a little bit in reverse like that, um, and this, that would be to, you allow your body to expand. <sighs> Oftentimes, uh, you're able to move the air much more uh, easily, much more relaxed. And this is the fundamental thing is like, as I'm telling you how to hold the trombone, you might try to translate that to holding the clarinet or the trumpet or even the violin. And I'm trying to say, you know, like you need to make your body tall. Let's do a start with that. Make your body tall, um, hold the trombone in such a way that it feels like uh, the trombone's coming to you. And this is, I'll, I'll tell you the most common problem. And I catch myself doing this as well. Uh, and this is one of the main reasons that I think it's important to video record yourself. Um, your best teacher is you. Um, okay. Just everybody realizes that like your best teacher is you and you just don't allow yourself the opportunity to look at your playing objectively. The way you would do that is to video record yourself. Okay. And be your teacher. Okay. What would your teacher say? So this is what I observe of myself and a lot of my students is they put the horn up to play. They start to reach like this. Okay. You start to reach with their neck, okay? Some of that could be because you're trying to uh, reach for that embouchure pressure, the, the, the instrument on your face, right? Some of it because you just, you feel like you're going, like you're running out of air and you can support better with, your, with the power in your sound by, by flexing. And that does give you a little bit of oomph at the beginning, but really quickly that physicality shuts down your tone production, your resonance, the ring in the sound will disappear after about two or three notes. And so ideally you're making your body tall, stretching your body tall as you exhale. And that support is allowed to come from here, right? And you've got very easy pressure on the face. So yeah, this is, this is what it looks like when I play. Yeah. I wanted to ask that question mostly because a lot of times if I work with young students and I see young trombone players, I see that the hand position sort of all over the map. And I'm mm. always curious. I'm like, I don't want to say too much because I'm not a trombone player, but yeah, I'm not quite well, sure. So here's, it's really simple. Like rather than say you should hold the instrument exactly like this, right? Um, you know, because everybody's body's different. Right? right? Identify tension anywhere yeah. and just ask the question, does it need to be that tight? Right. Good. That's it. Just like, and, and I will tell you that, that more than anything, the answer has been to be in a question rather than like, 
like because when I when I hang on to an answer, my pride gets involved. Uh, I want to feel like I know, and that prevents me from being available to a greater solution. All right. So the the trick is to be in the mystery, and the trouble with that is is you never have that. Um, really, you'll, you'll never really have that, that moment to say, aha, I've got it, right? I, I, you don't get that ego rub like, like you do when you figure out the, the mystery or the, the, the math equation. You're like, aha, I'm smart. You know, like, right. <laughs> yes. You, you, you really do have to forego your ego and, and be in the question. And that's essentially, uh, you know, you're talking about posture, but essentially, uh, to me, that's what a warm up is. You've got like long tones, you know the notes it's easy for your brain to kind of check out unless you're in the mystery, essentially asking yourself, is there a way I can do this easier? Is there a way I can do this easier to, and, and essentially you, you answer the question. Does I, I tried less pressure. Does it sound better? No. Okay. We'll put it a little more pressure. Better. Let's try something else. I, I dropped my shoulder. Does that sound better? Yeah, it does. We'll keep doing that. And that's what long tones afford me at this point. It, it, I think that a lot of times young people look at long tones as strength building exercises or embouchure building exercises, and they can do that. But eventually you get to a point where like, you know, I can do long tones. It's not a problem. And, and I'm trying to figure out how to do everything that I've done in my life up to this point, but more efficiently. And you find that by being the question, essentially asking yourself every moment, is there a way I can do this easier? Right, right. And, and uh, so that's a great way to look at it because it is very easy when you're giving instruction to just say, here, here, here. Do this. Do this. Do <laughs> this. Do this. And instead of asking the questions, and that's such an important part of teaching. Yeah. What about, so you were listening to Tommy Dorsey when you were young, uh, and you know, your father's a music educator. Was there much singing or vocalizing of things when you were young? No. No. Uh, yes but not in the house. I was in youth choirs a lot. Um, I, I've always had good pitch. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm kind of proud to say as hard as, uh, as your degree is at Indiana, I, I was so good at ear training, I actually tested out of a semester of ear training. It was like, I've got a good ear. I've always had a good ear, okay? We balance each uh, other out, Toby. We, we were like, <laughs> We were very imbalanced. I added the semester you took away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was not a good student. Um, I got B's and C's in music theory and, uh, and um, music history was hard at, at Indiana. But, um, but your training, your training um, in piano, I did all right. Uh, Although so, I'm, I'm gonna guess though, that you and I have talked before, like uh, I think the last time we talked some somewhere along the uh, the way we were like, I wish I could take music history again. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Exactly. It was I'm a much better ear training student now than I was as a student. Yeah. That it. Well, I want to study it now because it was so. It was fascinating. It was just I took it over the summers, and so just the amount of material that we needed to learn was like trying to take a drink from a fire hose. I just couldn't. It was just too, so much coming at me, um, and moreover, I wanted to practice. And so, I'm not saying that's what everybody should do, but that's what I did. And it, and it was a risk, and I'm not really proud of it. Now that it's all said and done, I find myself still like breaking out my uh, my music history book, and uh, and wanting to study that early music. It, it, it was the early music that was harder at least for me, than the modern music. I found that a little easier to um, connect with, but I just find it fascinating how music evolved to be what it is today. Yeah. Uh, just utterly fascinating. But yeah. uh, Indiana, oh. Well, that's, but while we were there, now this is the, the next question. I'm sure this is something you've talked about a million times, but most people, if they see you now, you look like a normal, regular trombone player, but your embouchure was, Pretty to the side back then. It was, yeah. Let me let me uh, let me play that a little bit for you. Okay. It was. It looks familiar. I'll tell you what. That I have not played there in thirty years now. Is it thirty? No. Wait. I was no twenty years. It's 20 wow. years ago. 
Okay? Uh, now, it's out the front. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. I think it develops. And in point of fact, like, I'll, I'll be honest with you, like, looking back, because you talked about starting early, um, I. I am not certain why I played out of the side. I'll tell you why I ultimately ended up there. It was because um, of a, I was running across a construction yard uh, when I was six. So I had been playing trombone for about a year, and I tripped and fell on a wooden marker uh, stake. They'd staked off for a driveway, and I fell right here, and it went all the way through. Um, I often thought... I, I'm not sure if that's the reason that I played out of the side. I mean, I played out of the side. It was the only place that it felt comfortable to play, given all the scar tissue in the middle. But I've seen kids do this. Like, let me grab a different trombone just to show you. Because this is similar to what kids start with. Um, operating the slide when you're a kid, the gravity, the, the weight of the trombone is all out here. And a kid is oftentimes not strong enough to hold it up, at least for long periods of time. Moreover, they don't have the reach. And I'll tell you how you can get out to sixth position is to switch the angle like this. And in fact, you have a little more purchase on the weight of the trombone in general. I am not altogether certain that the reason I play out of the side was because of that scar thing. I actually wonder if it gravitated over there just because that was how I could hold the instrument for long periods of time. Remember, I told you I'm practicing for hours a day because I want to buy my own gum. My parents wouldn't buy my gum for me. So, uh, so like in point of fact, I think that the answer for starting kids that young would be to have them start on a smaller horn. Have them start on alto. In places in Europe, I've seen trombone choirs where you've got little kids playing on little E-flat horns. Wow. I think this is the answer. It's like trumpet players starting on a cornet. Maybe. Right. I think There's you're right. You're honest. As far as the, it's, it's a shorter instrument, they, they're not drawn down by the weight or the length. You know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, my daughter is playing horn, and uh, you know, she's tall enough now that she can carry the instrument herself. She's, she's 12. Mm -hmm. But when she was 7, 8, she was all doing all sorts of weird things, uh, trying to carry the weight of the instrument, and it was throwing the angle of attack off, like, all over the place. She was like, like this, because to have the horn in her, in, on her knee or just off of her lap, the way that most professionals will play, it was throwing the angle of the horn right here, like heavy top lip pressure. And so think about that, like the formative years of like figuring your embouchure out, the first time you figured out like for hours and hours a day, for months after months after months, you're reinforcing this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think uh, Dennis Brain has, has one of those like upward, upward embouchures and it's, it's a very common thing to see and typically it'll be because a kid started really early. Trombone players also be like, because right. the, the weight of the instrument is drawing them down after a period of time when they're young, it's just like, <laughs> right. they can hold on to it. <laughs> I, but I, have I, just, I wanted to hold here. that for a moment so you can see how attractive that is. <laughs> well, it's true. It, uh, yeah, the weight, that is, I think that's something a lot of maybe you know, if you have a band director as like a flute player or a clarinet player, they don't really quite understand how really the fulcrum point of that instrument, since Steve's there listening to it, but it really changes, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, I find with, with trumpet players, like the, you know, they, they do marching band and they're holding the instrument up and it yeah. changes where that, where that balance is and it goes against m what most people have, which is an overbite. Yeah. Right. And then they wind up adjusting and compensating other ways and creating tension in other ways mm. that, you know, maybe just aren't as obvious unless you've played the instrument a long time to think about it. You know, I would say that the answer to that would, would be to have like maybe a portrait of, of a model. Like if you had Maurice or Andre, like playing trumpet, like, cause kids look at that, they'll stare at it and like, huh, and they'll like see themselves and, yeah. But I, I do come back to, if you can get yourself to the place of the question, you know, like have a model to begin with, and then, you know, how much of this works for me? How much right. of it doesn't? Like to be in the question, of like the thing that sort of uh, keeps me going, like the thing that I see in my students as a uh, representative um, 
what's the right word, prediction of success is right. uh, consistent motivation. And the most consistent motivation comes from a sort of relentless curiosity. You know, think about the last time that you fell in love. Uh, you know, the other person is a fascination, holds a place in your, in your heart, like beyond your mind. Your concentration is just like finding out everything you, want to, you can about this person. It is like you're utterly curious about everything, their perspective, their, how did they become who they are. They're just utterly fascinating. And I think about applying that same adage of love to our growth on the instrument Right? So that curiosity of how can I do what I want to do better, what I've been doing better, let alone how do I do what they're doing? Like how, right. do, I, how do I sound like, like what this other person sounds like? It, it, you know, and then sort of finding your own voice takes a relentless curiosity to carry you through the failure, which is the best teacher, right? But most people experience that failure and they're not curious enough to carry past the ego blow you know, that they took to carry, so that they continue learning from the failure. All that they remember is, is the fact that they screwed up. Anyway, well, and, that's... and I, I agree. I think it's important to fail really hard, you know, because I, I mean, guilty. totally done it and so grateful for it, you know. It took me 50 auditions to get to Boston, and I learned from every one of those failures. It, it, it took me 50 and, uh, and I think by the time I got to Boston, I had learned so much that I actually miss, I, I don't miss the failure, I'll be honest with you. Like it is, it was, I can think of a few like really painful ones, you know, that I, I had some lessons to learn. Um, but I miss learning as much as I learned from auditions. I don't really want to take any more, but like I actually miss that kind of pressure right. uh, performing. I miss learning from my, from my mistakes. The only time that I, I learn similarly is when I've got a major solo when we're on tour. Like when the time that I learned the most about my playing and how to deal with pressure and, and how to mitigate my shortcomings and the things that I needed to practice was when we went on tour with Mahler 3 and Shostakovich 4, which both have huge trombone solos on them. We went on tour in Europe after Tanglewood, so my face was really fried after Tanglewood, which is three concerts a week all different programs uh, all summer long here in, in Tanglewood. And then at the end of that, we go on our Europe tour uh, and that's like Mahler 3 and Shostakovich 4 every night. I learned so much and <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I was like this close to like really screwing up. And then one time in Paris, I actually did just like I clammed. And, and I was like, oh, maybe nobody noticed. But sure enough, they wrote it in the review the next day. I was like, Perfect. oh, <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> Now, do you speak French? Could you read the review or did somebody point no, out? No, the, the BSO was kind enough to translate it for us. Nice. Very, that's kind. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of that motivation, I mean, and I, I, every time I've done one of these chats, I've, I've been a broken record about how fortunate people are that grew up on LPs and CDs because like you mentioned, like a picture of Maurice Andre, you have that all-encompassing motivation you have the picture you have the liner notes you have all those things and that's a little it's, it's harder now i think to get the curiosity right in front of your face the same way as when you had the yeah well the would you agree that the the market's a bit saturated oh, with great yes. playing and and we become like maybe students become a little um immune to the value of great playing great posture and like um, even the lessons to be learned, the, the music that's published, it, it's all there at the fingertips. And the trouble with um, a proliferation of knowledge like that is people become passive and they're no longer curious because of the, the there's so much value at your fingertips all the time. But if you turn that inward, like that, like what do I want to do? Right. With all, like you give yourself an, an agenda, then suddenly it's a, it's a wealth of information that becomes a tool for what you want to accomplish of yourself. You know, it's like, I think that that's the hard part is we're just sort of overwhelmed with this saturated knowledge and great playing and great examples of what we hope to be. But what do you want to say? Right. Uh, what, do, what do you want to say musically? I think that especially now, uh, the grades are gone. The concerts are gone. Why? 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 Why would you do this? Right. And it's like Joel Silverstein, um, the former concert master of the BSO, 
uh, I was, I'm, I'm friends with the, some of the uh, violinists in the orchestra. We, we talk a lot about performance practice. Like one, one was a student of Heifetz and Joel Silverstein and uh, Victor Romanoff, and he was like, I said, tell me, like, what, what, tell me what's one thing that somebody told you that, that you learned the most from? You know, because I'm surrounded by rock stars, you know, and, and they all have their own stories, but I, I get really curious about what did your teacher tell you that you found most influ influential? And he said, Joel Silverstein, he said, uh, he had this really great um, quote about dealing with performance practice. You ready for it? I'm doing this for me. You can't really say that you're doing it for the money. It, it, I mean, if you're, if you're in music and you're doing it for the money, you chose poorly. I mean, you can right. make a lot more money with a lot less effort with <laughs> doing any, a lot of other career fields. Like if you were being financially responsible, you would be in finance, okay? Right. Right. So you're, you're doing this for you. When you understand that, you're like, well, what, what do I want to say here? What do I, and, and then like to, to come up with a solution that will carry your interest past a week, a month, a year. Like how many times are you going to play uh, the Haydn trumpet concerto? Or Handel, Handel, Haydn, which is? Haydn. Well, we have some Handel stuff. I guess right know. first? Yes, yes. You're right, <laughs> okay. you're right, you're right. Right. You know, so you have to come up with a phrase structure that's not necessarily even going to hold the interest of the audience. That would be nice, but like that's going to hold your interest, right? And it's probably going to be something that, that is complicated enough that you can't figure it out in a day, right? And so like trying to figure out how, like, how to do what you want to do with it once you're in your head is going to start to drive the things that you practice for your technique, the, uh, the things that you listen to, um, uh, ultimately who you study with, the equipment that you choose, the mouthpiece, it's all going to be decisions made because you have an idea in your head of what you want to sound like, which is much more noble than, well, I'm, I'm playing it this way because my teacher told me to. Exactly. Yeah, which, which has its own, like, it, it, yes, that's good, but it's not going to survive. And ultimately, your brain will figure out that, that the value of doing it for somebody else is, is not going to hold your attention as long as because this is the most honest version of me being myself, which is its own nobility. Uh, but I think that th with the saturation of really great playing, really great teaching uh, in the market now, uh, people can get confused unless they realize why, why are you doing long tones? Why are you doing your arpents? Why? It can't be for a grade. It can't be, although that's a nice thing. There's something that goes on beyond the, the grade because I'm still practicing my arpens. Why? Why? Because it helps me to make a better phrase. Why do you want to make a better phrase? Because it's the most honest version of the art that I have in my head. Okay, so this actually carries me through a lifetime of practice instead of a couple of months for a semester for a grade. Right. Right. And that's... And that's a very mature thought. It's hard to get that through to youngsters sometimes. Yeah, you know? <laughs> if you're talking to 12-year-olds. It's, it's hard. Even, but, even, but, even 22 year olds I have a hard time. Uh, I have a hard time getting that all the way across the street. You're, you're probably right. You're but probably right. but, but ultimately, it's, it's, it's right. I mean, we do, we do do it for us. I mean, we ha you have to, especially at a time like this right yeah. now, right? I mean, I, I think a lot of us struggle like, well, I don't have anything coming up or I'll take a couple of days off or I'll do this or that. And, you yeah. know, and ultimately we would just, we just want to play. So, yeah, you know, what, yeah. so, so back to when you were young, I mean, what, uh, what equipment did you start on? Like mouthpiece wise, what was that? I had a King 3B Silver Sonic. Mm -hmm. It was um, it has sterling silver bell with gold interplate, literally 22 karat gold plated on. Um, I think I still have it. Um, got a rich sound. There was real clarity to the, to the tone color itself. Um, ultimately switched to a Con 88H mm -hmm. for a few years when I was in high school and then arrived at a Bach 42 um, when I left high school. And I played that until I was done at Indiana. Okay. So... Um, I, I have a box sound in my head, but it it's like it never left the sort of like King Con sound, right. which is um, kind of that. Uh, I think in Cleveland they played Benjes, 
which is King. Um, but they actually, they're playing box now still. They are, yes, but like back in the day. Oh, back like, in the day. Oh, back back in, the, in the yeah, they're all on box now. But at, back in the day, they that they had that, uh, and then like the Con 88H sound um, is that's more of like a European orchestra. That's like in my head for trombone, that's about as close as you can get to a Deutsche Bass sound, like an American Deutsche Bass sound, sound right. like that Christian Lindbergh sound, that kind of like uh, really exciting clarity. But the, the the heft is what was missing, uh, and so that's I. I like that that kind of box sound, uh, and then ultimately that what I'm playing on now is like uh, Edwards made me. Um, I, I try to reach an amalgam, an aggregate of a of a con and a Bach together. Right. Um, so that's what this is. Um, con and a Bach together. Yeah. Now almost the same. We'll leave that one alone. <laughs> So, so after you were li- as you were growing up, I mean, and you mentioned Tommy Dorsey early on, and we were talking about models. Where did your ear start to go as you progressed and you got older? Uh, older is like high school. Yeah, older was then it was Christian Lindbergh um, and J.J. Johnson. I listened to a lot of those guys. J.J. Uh, yeah. Johnson in particular, uh, a lot of J.J. Johnson. Um, and then. Uh, and then it was Joe. It was a long time with Joe, just listening to Joe a lot. And then started to gravitate more towards Christian Lindbergh. Um, uh, and now I don't listen to trombone players that much at all. I'm listening to vocalists. It's right. all like I can't. And, and I wish that I would have started sooner. Um, but I started to math this out. Tell me if this math makes sense to you. Like, I noticed that, like, I can only count to three. I'm just warning you. Okay, this is this is more <laughs> of a social math, so I don't know. Okay, I'm trying to value, um, I'm trying to value trombone, right, and mm-hmm. brass players in particular, right. Um, so I was talking to um, Hoken Hardenberger a few years ago, and he told me he came to this solution early in his career that if he was going to make a living as a solo trumpet player his money was not going to come from other trumpet players. And, um, and I thought that, you know, actually that's true for all of us. If I'm a trombone player making my money from other trombone players, I'm not going to make much money. And, uh, and it, it's, it's not because of uh, us being penniless at all, although that might, may or may not be true. I'm not trying to make that point. I'm trying to say that, like, it's hard for an instrument to value itself because you're talking about people that are... Um, are, are vying for their own work, okay? So philosophically, you can't really look for peer review to your own instrument. Typically, you're going to be hired by non-brass players. Like when you win something big, for example, you're going to be hired by your music director, okay? Right. So, and odds are, they're not going to be a trumpet player. Uh, that's not true for my orchestra, but it, it's true for most, okay? So, uh so I started thinking, well, you know, these conductors are great musicians. Um, they're, they're great. They know what good music is. That's, they're good at, at judging, you know. And, and, and in fact, I would say, what about like the concert master is going to have a lot to say in an audition, right? Probably Principal Obel. If you look at who has the, the melody per concert, you're looking at concert master, oboe, principal trumpet, and principal horn. Sometimes principal trombone, right? But usually it's going to be those first four plus a music director. And these are what you would consider as great musicians. If you look at the pay scale of the orchestra, they're typically the best paid in the orchestra. Concert master, principal oboe, principal horn, principal trumpet, okay? Money reflects the value of the fact that they are great musicians, right? But let's go a step further. Who gets paid better than conductors? Vocalists. And so if you're, if you're talking about like uh, following a model yeah, it's good to start, I think, with your own instrument just to get a sound concept and even to observe with videos like good technique. How are they getting, how are they operating the instrument? The mechanics of the horn, how to breathe, how to, what your posture is and everything like that. But as far as understanding what goes into a compelling phrase, something that people will pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year because of your brilliant phrase structure, what you can look to are vocalists because for some reason with a tighter dynamic range, and a tighter uh, tessitura range, they are able to manifest interest of hundreds of thousands of people. 
by comparison to tens of people if you're a trombone <laughs> player, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so like, you know, part of it is words. You have to understand that, like, I, I can't really build character and, a, and a, convince, a compelling narrative like you could if I were if you were telling a story, like a, a, a tenor, a great tenor can tell a story that has context and, you know, both, a, you know, the here and the now, romantic interest, a compelling antagonist, you know, just like somebody has some lessons to learn and wow, we got an opera, a compelling story. Why? Because of words. But oftentimes people go to the opera and they don't understand a lick of what's going on. Right? They don't understand German, and yet they still go because it's just compelling. The tone quality, how they get the, the job done with that, like, you know, how do they fill up the hall with such an incredible sound? If you watch a singer breathe, they seem to do it easier than brass players. Like, you go to a brass recital, you're hearing them breathe all the way through, right? When's the last time you went to an opera and you heard a, a great vocalist breathe? You know, so, like, I, I feel like they have a lot of things figured out that we need to try to hold ourselves accountable for. And the number one thing would be compelling, compelling phrase architecture. Mm -hmm. We are following, we're chasing our own tails, right? Trying to follow other instrumentalists that play our same instrument instead of putting that finish line a hundred yards further away to try to find a greater model, yeah. okay? So like now, like before, like I'm, I'm listening to great trombone players. I'm trying to copy their technique, their phrasing, their tone color, their, their everything that I can. I'm like white on rice on a paper plate, a styrofoam cup of milk in a snowstorm. That's me <laughs> trying to figure out another trombone player, right? But now it's like a puzzle where I'm trying to figure out why, why is Kwasthoff so awesome? Why is Jonas Kaufman, Kaufman, Jonas Kaufman is like, I listen to this tenor and I'm like, oh my God, how does he create these phrasing? How does he pace the rhythm? How does he pace the, the dynamics, right? And I can literally pick up my horn, go on IMSLP and find the Strauss song or the, um, or the, or the Schubert song that Kwasthoff is singing or the Mozart aria and, and just try to copy all of the elements of phrase structure that will directly apply to the trombone, especially tone color. Um, and, and I just feel like, you know, to tie a bow on it is, I'm, I'm saying that we, we as an as a industry, like brass players as an industry, are, are kind of losing our way following each other. We need to be uh, like aiming a little higher and it's actually a bit more accessible than we think because it's not about playing louder it's not about playing faster it's about playing with dynamics and rhythmic pacing on a simple melody because vocalists get paid so much more and it's not for good reason it's not for bad reason right they are great musicians let's start with that and then technique starts to serve your musical goals much more fundamentally you understand so like why are you practicing your scales? Because I want to be able to do this effortless phrase like Kwasthoff does, right? Or like Jesse Norman does, right? right? I want to figure out how to do my scales better, elegantly, easily, so that people aren't distracted by my terrible technique and they can hear this incredible tone color just like Jesse Norman. Right. That's why brass ensembles still play transcriptions of vocal music, right? I mean, I, I think it's a variety. I mean, th what I've discovered myself is that on IMSLP, you know, I, a lot of my, my research now is just, uh, I, I go through, I type in Mozart soprano aria, and I just listen until I find something I like. And because it's Mozart, it's public domain, I go on IMSLP, I can download it, put it on the iPad, and immediately I'm just like following whatever vocalist I'm, I'm hearing, I'm just like trying to follow their pacing, their, their breathing. First thing I do is take breath dictation, then I take dynamic dictation, then I take uh, articulation dictation because, you know, like T is gonna have a harder syllable than an R, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so I... <laughs> Where, anyway. What, so who, who would you say that you listen to the most? I mean, you mentioned Kwasthoff and Jesse Norman. Yeah, uh, Kwasthoff is at the, he's at the top, um, but uh, Kaufman, uh, hang on, I'll, I'll tell you who's on my playlist the most right now. Just bear with me. I see Steve on here. I'm curious playlist. about this one. I'm going to unmute him. 
Graham Johnson and Jean Paul. Wow, I can't read that. Hey, Steve. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? Beautiful day in Chicago. <laughs> Somewhere over the rainbows where you are. Exactly. We've had a little stormy evening. Yeah. So, Toby, before I ask Steve the same question, what, name those singers one more time for so people are listening that are students. I, I, the one that I hadn't told you was uh, Mitsuko Shirai. She's a mezzo, uh, and she's, uh, she's my go-to for Berg arias and Mozart. I think she's a brilliant phrase architect, and uh, she sings either right on pitch for me playing alto, mm -hmm. or I, I just play down an octave, uh, and, and she's just an incredible phrase architect. The fact that she can do that for both Mozart and Berg makes it, I think, a fundamentally a, a good model to, to copy. Steve, what about you? Do you have some vocal examples that you like to think about? So when I was a student, um, I listened to Schubert and Schumann and Wolf Lieder with Dietrich Fischer Dieskau and as well as uh, Jussi Björling and, and uh, Fritz Wunderlich. So these are all tenors. Right. It was a similar idea. I tried to bring the trumpet down an octave to get the richness of the male voice. And then for sopranos, there were several. Uh, Montserrat Caballé is a great Spanish uh, soprano who's just one of the most beautiful voices and, and musicians in the whole world. And, and for Baroque music and Mozart, Arlene Auger. And she's a couple of generations back. So most of these are actually a couple of generations back. Yeah. But of, of um, the, the, the current crop, uh, if you haven't heard Lorraine Hunt Lieberson sing both Bach and contemporary music, you could hear her sing she did a whole series of, of uh, operatic stagings with Peter Sellers of the Bach cantatas. And wow. uh, one of them is really, uh, Ich habe genug is the one that uh, really comes to mind where she's, it was staged as she was a, a chemo, um, a cancer patient with taking chemo with the whole thing. And then five years later, she developed cancer. It was just hard, heartbreakingly um, beautiful. She's a Bostonian, actually, Toby. I'm writing it down. Yeah, Toby. thank you. I'm I, so, and then I'm, and, I'm short on Bach. What, what? Uh, can you give me some like uh, some anything, Bach arias to go on? Anything she sang. Oh, I was afraid. Yeah, so I was that. when you were when you were looking for things to write down on. I was mentioning that she did all the recordings with Peter Sellers. Um, yeah. With the Bach Emanuel Group in Boston, and um, they're they're just exquisite. And then. There are songs that Peter Lieberson, who was a great um, Bostonian composer, and um, he wrote uh, songs based on Neruda, on Pablo Neruda, that are just gorgeous. Oh yeah, yeah. the poet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. You know, he wrote, and they, they were, and they were married to each other, so that was there was this tremendous energy. My but, favorite you know, Pablo Neruda is like, uh, is like talking about a, how to get over a breakup. It's like. We of that time are no longer the same. Love is so short and forgetting is so long. <laughs> Just in so far as it's so easy to fall in love, but it's so long <laughs> to get over it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, Marit is great. Yeah. yeah. You know those names you mentioned? I mean, Bjorling and, and that generation. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's Wunderlich. Wunderlich. It's, yeah. And that was actually his name. It wasn't like a stage name. Can you believe it? You know, a, to have you know a wonderfully. His name is Wonderly. <laughs> well, I had a I had a colleague at a college I taught at, and her last name was was Wonderlick. Yeah. Wonderlick. I said no relation. No, <laughs> but fine singer, but not related. But um, yeah, well, I saw you on there. I wanted to get your your take on that because I knew that you would have. I knew you would have an answer on some singers that you like. And I also found it an interesting, Toby, that you were talking about, and I'm sure, Steve, you would say the same thing. There's certain singers you're listening for, for certain timbres, for certain instruments, for certain styles and pieces. Um, yeah. You know, when you're kind of like, Toby, if you're getting in sort of your Mozart Requiem zone, wh where do you yeah. go with that, with your ear? Well, okay, so if I'm doing the Requiem, then I'm... 
I'm listening to mezzos and sopranos because I'll be playing the alto, right? But if I'm going to play the um, if I'm going to play the tuba mirum solo, then I'm I'm going to listen to uh, tenor arias and even baritone arias. Uh, so um, definitely, like, because I'm glad that you brought up Dietrich Fischer Diskau because that one in particular, like, he's in the same range as Kwasthoff, but there's a lot more highs in the timbre of his voice uh, for probably a variety of reasons. I mean. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure you would agree that uh, Fischer Diskau is like a generation before Kwasthoff, uh, but you know, I, I'm told that he, he drank and he smoked a fair amount, so that like that's going to affect the timbre of his voice. So I'm, I'm trying to give you like I'm not trying to say don't smoke or don't drink or like maybe you probably shouldn't do either one, but maybe you should. I don't. I'm, I'm not trying to say that. <laughs> I'm trying to say that like I want the soloistic timbre to be pervasive to the two of Miram solo, right? Um, so like, cause frequently trombone players will approach this with a bit too of a round sound and, uh, it, it comes off without this sort of, uh, ominous trumpetiness that should be there sort of calling the souls home to be judged. It, it, it is not a happy thing, right? So, uh, I want to have a bit of grip in the sound, right? With the, the, the power, but I don't want it to be effortful. And so uh, I think, number one, I actually, in, in, I'm glad you brought this up, but I do warm up and choose songs that are directly to what I have to do with the service of the day. So for example, I'm not gonna play a lot of Kwasthoff baritone arias to get ready for, for Bolero. Um, I'm gonna probably listen to a mezzo or even a soprano, like play a soprano aria down an octave, right? Right trying to get the highs and the sound in that easy upper register. Uh, but if I'm going to play Tuba Miram, I am probably going to listen to Dietrich Fischer Diskau and his Mozart arias are pretty, pretty compelling. Um, maybe, I don't, I'd be curious if you, this is something I, I just came up with today is like I was uh, looking at a Kirschel number 152 and I was noticing that uh, the early Mozart has a lot of leaps that are not as prevalent in the later Kirschel numbers. Uh, so you can use that to your advantage, uh, sort of like you, you want to find something that helps you to accomplish an easy cantabile. And some of that earlier Mozart, the, these appositurias are not easy to do without a bit of like technical. <laughs> you want to take that out of your playing. Yeah, and, I'm, and what I'm noticing too is you're describing this as, I mean, everything is coming at this from a musical point of view. I don't sense there's the, if I do this 10 times, I'll be good. You know, you're really right from the beginning. I mean, there is an element of the training for sure, but the overall approach is guided by sound and music as opposed yeah. to the physical. And that, that seems to be like, it also helps you stay out of your own way. A bit, yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it goes without saying. Let's consider like I, I lift weights, right? Right. When I lift the weights, I'm thinking I got to get a 10. Okay, or I got to get eight, or I, I need to do this for an hour, right? Uh, it's, it's putting the time in, and it's possible that I'll focus on that so much that it doesn't become about like sculpting anything or even arriving in a sort of cardiovascular shape. It's like, uh, and it, it just takes the joy right out of it, right? A lot of times people are exercising because they, they want to keep up with their kids. This is much more sustainable over a long period of time. Your brain knows when it gets bored. When, you're, when your mind is bored, you just give it a little bit more time being bored and you'll find plenty of reasons not to practice, not to do the scale, not to like, so like you, you end up talking yourself out of a lot of things just because your interest isn't there anymore. And it extends not just to music, but like to relationships, to learning any skill, right? To um, your relationship with yourself, right? When you're no longer interested in what you're doing, who you are, who you're going to become, like it's just like your apathy comes in right so it can't be about putting the time in although time is necessary because why you're just building consistency the difference between an amateur and a professional is amateur gets it once calls it good professional practices until they they can't miss okay so you are the, having repetition but it's so that you can be and I, and I said this before you want under pressure to give an honest representation to the art that's in you, in, in you, right? Like anymore when I'm playing, I, I feel 
a great sense of loss when I screw up under pressure. Why? Yes, it's embarrassing, but I told a lie. Right? I, I represented something different than what I had in my mind or my heart that I wanted to say artistically. And, and that I, I feel this loss, like oh, I, I just lied about how much I love this solo. And I, I just, I, I need to do it again. I need to practice some more because I can't, I just can't have that be true anymore that I, that I lied. And that's, that's what people think I had to say artistically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and kind of going back into, I mean, taking a step back, you're talking about the physical aspect of like, yes, I have to do these certain things. You know, we have to do certain exercises and maintain a kind of a stamina as brass players that it's, you know, it's an, un, it's an unforgiving thing. It's, uh, I know Steve agrees with that. You know, it's like, it's, we have to do it. You know, we have to play our long tones. We have to play our flexibility exercises. We have to do these things. And I've always known you to have a tremendous work ethic. As a matter of fact, um, you know, a couple of weeks back, uh, a lot of us from school had like a, a chat where we were just talking on Facebook, trying to rid ourselves of the Corona for a couple of hours. And you were like, you know, guys, I have to leave. It's 1230. I have to practice. And I think a lot of people would be surprised at that. But you were like, oh, I'm sorry. I usually practice from what, 12 to 2? Is that what you said? Yep. 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 Yeah. Talk about why. Yeah, I mean, you said that you practice before we started. You said you practice like from 7 to 9 or 7 to 8. I don't know when you said yeah, that. Like, like that. Yeah. I just have never been a morning person, I, you know. <laughs> I, yeah. I, and, but then also, too, I will say the reason I do that, and, and that's not to say that, like, that's the point of your question, but, um, but the reason that I practice late is, is out of habit, and it's because I need to stay fresh for the orchestra concert. Right. So, like, I build my practice agenda around playing well for the services that I have. So, like, a, I have a short morning warm-up, like, 15, 20 minutes, and then I play the rehearsal on mm -hmm. fresh face, right? Mm -hmm relax through the day and then play the concert in the evening on still fresh face. Like I may have practiced like a half hour, 40 minutes, but never to the point of fatigue. But the truth is like practicing my fundamentals and getting the repetition in is going to fatigue me. And the time that I've discovered that I can do that and not uh, sacrifice the quality of my playing during the orchestra services is to practice usually after it's all over. So typically from midnight to one or two in the morning, and then I'm, and then I'm, I've got my practice in. I'm still fresh for my orchestra services. I don't have an assistant in Boston, so I, I don't have a rest time. A lot of times in a concert, I play every piece, and right. there's no escape. So this is what the solution that I've come to. And I'm, I, the reason I'm saying that is just like, please don't think that I'm advocating everybody should practice <laughs> from 12 to 2 in the morning. There is a very good reason why I do it that way. Right. Right, but I was I was bringing it up to just sort of illustrate the discipline that it has to do the job you have, you know, back it up. I mean, sometimes people's perception is like, oh, well, you know, they've got the job and the job keeps them in shape or, you know, they're really gifted or whatever. And there are elements of truth to that, but it's, you still have to put the time in. You still have to, you know, no, I, you got to play do. with rock stars. I'm just trying to keep up. Well, that, that whole brass section is full of rock stars. There's no doubt about that. I mean, um, so what about, uh, you know, I know we've been going here for like almost an hour. Um, I wanted, I did want to talk about the Amisher change because that's oh, yeah. really a pivotal point. Can you kind of talk about, I mean, Mick Mulcahy okay, guided you through that, right? Uh, or am I wrong? About I wouldn't that? say that. Um, I wouldn't say that. Uh, and that's, that's not a slide against him. It just, it was a project that took longer than I was with him. So, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so, uh, the, I, my heart goes out to people doing an obisher change because it does throw off the schedule of you know, getting degrees, doing recitals. Um, the hardest part about an obisher change is it takes about two years to sound normal and it takes six years to feel normal. And I've not, spoken to anybody that says that that's done it successfully uh that that says much different um unless it's like a really slight embouchure change but as i showed you earlier the the embouchure change that i made was pretty dramatic okay so what we do has to be easy 
we need to like that's what virtuosos are. There's somebody that make that makes something very challenging look easy. Okay, so remember that when you're practicing, people are not paying to see you do something hard and see how hard it is. They they want to see you do something challenging and see how easy it is. Okay, the trouble is that the the structure of how we do things is uh, it it takes some conditioning and. Um, figuring out how to like navigate that interval is um, it takes patience and it's hard to feel like you uh, you know what you're doing like that you haven't lost your way um, frequently what I see happen is people get one to two years into an embouchure change and they give up either they, they give up and they go back to what they were doing before or a version of what they were doing before or they give up and they're an attorney. Because frankly, if you take the discipline that it takes to succeed even halfway on the trumpet, trombone, whatever, and you apply it to another career field, you'll be fine. You'll never go hungry, you'll be fine. That industry necessary just to succeed in the slightest is uh, it, it's something that applies to any career field. And that's what I remember, like when, when you know, I'm sure you've had the experience of teaching somebody and you can tell they're not talented enough for a career to happen. What is the value of the lessons you're teaching? you're teaching them a life skill. You're teaching them a life skill of accountability and industry ambition and through their own discipline they can manufacture success on their own. Apply that concept to any career field, they'll be fine. So insofar as making an amateur change, uh, I learned a couple of really important things and, and one is, um, is patience. Uh, Steve, you told me something once right after I uh, changed my embouchure. I said, gosh, I need to build strength here. And I remember this very specifically. You said, you've got too much strength. That's the problem. And, uh, and that's really it. Learning, when, you, when you're developing your, your, uh, your playing, your embouchure, it's not strength. It's actually, think of it like, like climbing a rock wall and you need to figure out each handhold to hold on as lightly as possible. If you hang on too lightly, you just fall off. If you hang on too tight, you run out of grip strength and you can't make it to the top of the rock wall. So, uh, and I got that actually, that analogy is from Carl Lenthe, who told me something probably within the same week. Um, it, it's learning, when you're learning your embouchure, when you're developing your playing, you're trying to figure out how lightly you can hang on to and another way, to, I think this is in the inner game of tennis, said maybe a little more succinctly. Think about like your, your tone, your technique is like holding on to a baby bird in, in the palm of your hand. You hang on to it too tight, you crush the life out of it. Too loose, it flies away. So it's like all of your practice is trying to figure out how lightly you can hang on to life. <laughs> so um, two that things was, I learned. That was Harvey Penick. Who was that? Harvey the, Harvey. the sword master? No, the, the, yeah. the golf pro. Yeah. The golf pro. Yeah, holding on to I, the bird. Yeah. In the inner game of tennis, it's, it's presented as uh, somebody learning how to hold on to a foil. But I think it's true probably for golf, probably for brass playing. So you can apply it to a, like, that Goldilocks zone is just, uh, it applies to many career fields. But what I wanted to say is that um, when I changed my embouchure, I had this really painful process of being dismissed by teachers and colleagues because I sounded like shit all the time. Like I, I had moments when I, I sounded good, but I couldn't hang on to him. I had no endurance. And it's like my brain, my mind knew how to play trombone and uh, I, I couldn't make my body do it. And what lesson that taught me is that you will in your, in your career notice people that have all the answers that you need to hear, but they can't show you, right? They have the musical intelligence that you need to listen to, but they can't show you because their body won't do what they ask it to. Um, I think we were in that class with uh, Dominic Sperry, he talked about going through Bell's palsy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm thinking about uh, people that I've, I've met along the way that were going through focal dystonia. And you have examples of, of older players as well that are really great musicians, but they just, their bodies can't do it. Does that mean that the value of the knowledge is gone? Now, let's be honest, like some of the times that I learned the most was when uh, 
Joe demonstrated exactly what he was trying to say. Scott did the same thing with a bit of like prodding and then, because uh, I, I remember he didn't really like to play in lessons. Um, and then Mulcahy was very generous demonstrating things. And these sounds, you know, my mind just kind of figured it out. The parts that they didn't say, my mind figured it out, okay? Uh, these, the fact that, that your brain works on products, I'm not trying to say that that isn't of great value, but what I learned was that my body would not do what I wanted it to, and that didn't mean that my intelligence was gone. However, I was often treated as such. Right. And that's the, the biggest lesson that I would have from that experience, and that, that actually carried me through uh, a lot of tricky moments in my career moving from then, was to value uh, musical intelligence oftentimes uh, that gets overlooked. And, um, and so I found a few teachers that were not playing professionally that really, really helped me. Roger Rocco, I wouldn't be where I am without him. Mm -hmm. um, and it, he had a lot of like sort of buzzing and breathing techniques that carried me through when nobody had the patience to listen to me. Um, and another one was John Swallow. And John Swallow uh, had retired. He was, he was recovering from cancer. But his intelligence, his musical intelligence, I, he's like the most, uh, forgive me, Steve, like he's the most influential teacher of my life. Uh, and it had to do with, uh, you know, you were, the, you were my teacher as well. You're not alone, though, in saying that. I mean, he <laughs> was one of the great artists on the, of all brass instruments. He's like, he's like a Dennis Brain kind of musician. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're I, so... You know, and we were, we were talking about another player that sort of like made a career sort of um, helping young people and the ability to make a very complicated idea succinct and comprehensible to a young person keeps you young. And I saw him, like he said that to me one time, but then like listening to him speak about very complicated French etudes uh, in, in so far as mixed meter and tonality, sort of harmony of the melody, uh, in such a way that stuck. And then making practical solutions to, uh, you know, I think that oftentimes people like, like ourselves might offer information as idealisms. Like, you do this because it's the only way to do it. Or uh, do this or I'll give you an F. You know, kind of like, you know, do this or else. And the kid does it much out of fear you know, or a desire to seek my approval than because it's intelligent. And that's the way that John presented the, uh, the information. It was, it was so intelligent. It was undeniable. And you just had to, and there was even sometimes he'd like smack me upside the head and he's like, and he swear a lot. I won't swear, but he'd be like, why, why would you do it like that? But he'd put pepper in a few swear words, just kind of like, and you need that kind of like grandfather smacking you just like, stop it. <laughs> Well, that, that also gave you a mental toughness that probably has paid off with your current job too, right? I would imagine. Well, I know. Yeah. That, because I've gone through I, this. I think that the mental toughness based on a perception uh, of my own method of pragmatism rather than idealism. Because in more than anything, idealism has left me um, <laughs> wanting. Uh, but uh, pragmatism, I got I to gotta figure out how to get through this concert as well as possible. I'm going to be a pragmatist. And right. That's carried me through more than anything else. Well, and what was the discipline like when you were going through it? I mean, you know, you said you people were dismissive and, and you know what, what you want in your head, but it's not physically coming out. I mean, what did you learn in that? Or how did you, how did you do it? I overpracticed. I wish I hadn't. There's one thing that I tell my students, the thing that I learned the most, and that is to, uh, to keep success intact when you're practicing. You need to stop while you're ahead. And uh, frequently I would try to practice through failure. I would be tired. I would be doing things inefficiently and I would be reinforcing failure. Your body remembers that and it carries, you know, if every time you see somebody, they punch you in the gut, it doesn't take too long before you just hear their name and you immediately flex, right? And, and that's like, failure is the same way. Uh, so like I said that, you know, failure is the best teacher, but like, I'm talking about it in a different way. I'm, I was reinforcing um, tightness that comes from just trying too hard. And uh, I, if I did do over again, 
I would have um, I, I would have practiced like a half hour at a time, much smaller intervals throughout the day, and I would have switched to a smaller mouthpiece uh, because I would be seeking efficiency and then like allow my equipment to get larger as I become more and more uh, comfortable. So I would have I've, I would have switched to equipment that was easy to play, super easy to play, and I would have practiced uh, at smaller intervals, like half hour tops, peppered throughout the day instead of like, I would have intervals of hour, or hour and a half, unnecessary. I should have like broken that up. And um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's much else to have been done except uh, to get to the teachers that were helping me um, the most. Joe really helped me uh, just saying one thing. He said, like, are you impatient? Are you an impatient man? And I said, yeah. He says, well, you need to understand this is going to take a while. Yeah. And uh, just knowing that was enough to allow it to take a little bit of time. That's okay. Right. And then, um, and then Roger Rocco just really, uh, he said, we need to get you breathing and buzzing more than anything else. And so it was like a, um, one board doni a day, three times buzz a phrase, one time play it. Every time, take as deep a breath as possible and, uh, and get the air moving. And, and so essentially, I, I did that for a summer. And at the end of the summer, I won a job. And uh, I, I wish that could be the, the case for everybody. I mean, there was, there was, there was, that was about like two years in to a process. But uh, like having somebody say, look, this is going to take a little bit of time. And another person saying, hey, just you need to focus on your breathing and buzzing as if you had nothing in this life, nothing else in this life to accomplish. Just do it for a summer and I think you'll be fine. That's all I really needed, you know, because everything else is just like, yeah, I just don't have time for you. I'm sorry. Well, and I probably yeah, got you out of your own head, right? Because then you're you're thinking more about the yeah. singing in your head and the singing in your head and it distracts from the obvious physical Things that are it's a confirmation bias of the things that are around you. Like when it's not working and nobody wants to give you the time of the day, you see the confirmation of why they're not going to give you the time of the day. And that, um, you know, by, by contrast, and I don't, I, I'm not trying to put this at, at anybody's feet. Like it's your fault. I didn't, uh, I didn't succeed earlier. And I'm not trying to say that at all. I'm just trying to say these things really helped me. Uh, these two things really helped me. Yeah. And just to know that it's going to take a little bit of time. And just be patient and really focus on song and wind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, everything playing an instrument takes is it's like, a, you know, we're so used to everything being fast on a computer, but an instrument takes as long as it's always taken to learn. You know? Yep. So, but, um, well, hey, any, uh, I mean, we're about, I'm going to wrap up in just a second, but um, were there, but, I wanted to go back to the mental thing one more time. Were there books or movies or, or imagery that kind of got you through that, you know? Um, I took a conducting class. And that really helped. Um, movies. I think about Rocky, I guess, is what I'm... Yeah, that, but honestly... Um, <laughs> there, there are quotes that that help me, and I they're not really repeatable. Maybe one is, but there's like more to it. Like the, one of my favorite, it's like Sean Connery. You know, it's like if you watch the Bond films, it's kind of a, a cool class that he carries through. Is he's you never get the impression that he what he's doing is easy, but he's just kind of like a a very goal driven person making um, hard decisions moment by moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there's like a smoothness, like a um, uh, sort of like a Zen quality with that, you know, how he's going through, like easy come, easy go kind of thing. I don't know, like they helped me, but I think that sometimes people would, would take like, oh, from that you're trying to be James Bond. No, no, no. <laughs> but I can pretend to be James Bond for an hour. And right. that's kind of how I would like, so there was that, and then um, Zen and the Art of Archery really, really helped me. It still helps me. I still listen to that when I run because it's such a great sort of practice culture to have. Um, and then um, Inner Game of Tennis really helped me a lot. Uh, and I still listen to that book and read it um, 
constantly. Um, ultimately, what you have to do as far as an Amish change, but even without that, is realize that it comes down to staying motivated. And I think frequently people think that motivation is going to come from outside. And, and it is helpful when it does, but that's, I, I think if people took more personal responsibility to staying motivated, like, you know, then it's, you can try a hundred things that I've offered today and just like, maybe it's going to work for you, maybe it won't. But I don't want you to think about like these like our ideals that you need to strive for, like be like James Bond or like like Song and Wendrick, Roshu, like like I told you to do it with that methodology. I don't want to say that at all. I want to say that like the thing that was consistent all the way through that was me taking personal responsibility to stay motivated. As if like I'm going to um, be personally invested in my own inspiration. I cannot hope to be inspiring as a musician, if I don't take responsibility to be inspired as a part of my practice every day. Why am I inspired? Because motivation is key. That's what's going to carry me through. I want to come up with a cultural expression of my art, of my playing, that will transcend the length of my undergrad, my master's, my audition experience. I want to come up with a cultural ideal for the way I approach music that will transcend the audition today, right? So I can carry with me the lessons that I've learned and not look at it like, oh, I won or I lost, and that's the, that's the most interesting thing that happened today, right? I'm trying to find a cultural expression for my practice that will transcend even my career in the BSO. Right. So uh, that comes down to like staying motivated to <laughs> demonstrate truth, which is really existential, but that's, um, when you think about your musicianship as your phrasing, that it, you're, you're trying to find your truth. That's the reason that you're practicing your technique, because you want to give a truthful representation of the music inside you. That, the quality of that, will carry you past winning the job, right? And then you can trust that your playing won't falter in the same way that it would for a lot of players that win their job, get tenure, and everything just kind of like falls off after that. Right, right. Yeah, you're constantly challenged and you're still probing and trying to figure out things and looking for new answers all the time. I mean, that's... Stay curious. Stay curious. Well, that's evident on the recordings. I mean, you guys, every time you put a recording out, I think that's as good as it can be. And it seems like the next <laughs> one out, it's just that much better. So you guys are... In my opinion, the reason those Shostakovich recordings are good is because you've got 90 rock stars on stage and they are aggressively and i mean aggressively trying to play together yeah. so like whatever like crescendos and diminuendos pitch rhythm can all shift all over the place and they're not trying to play accurate although they are we are accurate it's we're aggressively trying to play together uh, that is the reason that the BSO works, in my opinion. Can you, I mean, can you talk a little bit about what Nelson's has done with that? I mean, it just seems like the BSO seems like it has so much vibrancy right now. And anytime you see him conduct it, it transcends a TV screen. I'm sure it's even more amplified in person. Um, the way that I heard it, and I wish these were my words, but uh, the way that I heard it described best is that as a conductor, he unleashes the orchestra. Okay, so you've got some pretty incredible musicians on stage, um, <clears throat> just really amazing uh, players. I mean, they're, they're exciting. I, I can't tell you, like I, I go to work and it's just like trying to keep up with rock stars. They're just so amazing. Everybody around me is so amazing. And he gets up there and uh, he's jumping the way you would never be told to jump in conductor school, emoting, throwing, uh, leaning back at the waist and leaning forward. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of like, um, you know, so much of what conductors do is just like, like trying to mold the clay and he's like, I don't, I don't, I'm trying to think of uh, like he, he's just like 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 
aggressively trying to get us to do more and faster and, and exciting. And, and uh, it just cannot be banal. It cannot be uh, passive. And uh, uh, I'm thinking, I told you about that, um, in that time when I chipped a note in Paris and it was loud. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, I was like, oh God, I just did that. And he looked at me and he goes, he just winks. <laughs> like, I'm glad you, it's just like, a, that's the, what you want from a conductor. He's like, we're in this, we got, I got you. you know? and, and it's like, I, I want you to keep going for it. Don't stop. That's, right. that's what he does. He's just like, keep going for it. Do not stop. Give it everything you've got. And obviously, trumpet players make fine conductors. I'm not <laughs> sure if Steve would agree with. <laughs> no, it just depends on the, on actually, trumpet players, not so much. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Trump, but trumpeters do. <laughs> what? What is that? Vocab? Well, no, it's like, think about it. If somebody, if you're a trumpet player, that's all you care about. But guys yeah. like, you know, Hokan and Andres and Schwartz, and there are others who are were really fine trumpeters. They put music first. I mean, when I was studying yeah. the Schwartz, all we talked about is how you could you could take a Mozart symphony, G minor symphony, and you could go and we would go through, we would do the entire movement, we'd go through in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bar phrases. And he says, what makes Mozart a genius is you could phrase it in any one of these ways and it would still be convincing. Mm. So the difference between being a, a brass player and a, a brass musician is they're very, very, very different. And the, mm. the ones who are musicians first are good conductors. Yeah. 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 That's, that's my, that's my, that's my soapbox. <laughs> that's <laughs> spoken from, a, spoken from a fine conductor. Right. <laughs> so. Well, you know, the one thing I can say is that I, I, I am of the same school as Nelson's, and that is I, I like to unleash the musicians. I like that I turn them loose to make the music, and then I point out what, what needs to be listened to and who we're tuning to. Because a lot yeah. of times people forget that if there's, a, if there's a glockenspiel or a marimba, they can't change pitch. <laughs> and we got to tune to them, unfortunately. Yeah. But anyway. Think about that the next time you hear the third movement of Peter Grimes, right? So, <laughs> so anyway, but um, well, gentlemen, it's been great. Steve, thanks for it's chiming. An honor. I didn't know this me. was going to be a private a private masterclass. I'm I'm really thrilled. I you know you threw it out on Facebook, and I thought you know half the world would show up. You know. Well, what'll happen is is I'm going to make a YouTube channel. So I've, so far, I've had uh, Gail Williams, Michael Sachs. Uh, Marcus Prinup, and now today Toby. Next week is Michael Mergen, who is, um, Michael's in the Marine Band, still is, and he is going to be the new trumpet teacher at Cincinnati Conservatory. Steve, at some point I'm going to have you on here. I'm trying to rash them out, so there's one against, but I definitely want to get you on. Oh, blowing smoke. I'm not blowing smoke. It's going to happen. I'm going to happen. We'll see if Rommel comes on. He's like, oh, I'm not famous, so shut up. <laughs> We'll get him on. If, <laughs> if I'm on, he has to be. Come oh, on. please. All the, more, all the more reason to have him on, actually. Oh, I know. Well, it's, but yeah, and so next month, I'll, once I get uh, one thing finalized, I'll, I'll let people know it's coming on. But the idea with this is, is I'm trying to ask some questions that some of the music teachers who are going to be going into teach next year might have for their young students. And then, of course, it's always going to develop into something a little a little deeper and, and uh, a little more brass musician oriented or philosophically oriented because these are strange times, no doubt mm. about it. And so anything we can do, I think, to support each other, I think that's, I think that's really, really important right now that we're just supporting each other and, and inspiring each other and trying to stay motivated. Yeah, it's the, you know, this is the, um, a critical time in history, actually. We're going to look back at this, and, or we're not going to be able to look back. You know, this is, we either start working together and create a more empathic and, and coordinated and collaborative society, or, you know, 
like they're saying in 50 years from now, the, the earth will be so warm that the, the coastal cities will flood and we'll be at war over water. And, you know, the, the despots will have, will have uh, you know, they'll be fighting each other over the spoils, but the rest of us will have, you know, cooked ourselves in our own soups. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, no, we have a, we have a great opportunity right now for, for a huge reset. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 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 Well, with that, thank you. Long tones. Long tones. And, uh, <laughs> moving long tones. I think I'm just going to keep forgetting now instead of the yeah. moment. But Steve, it's really great to see you. Mark, thanks for having me on. Well, it's great to see both of you. Yeah. And yeah. It's wonderful to, you know, hear your, your whole journey and, and, and perspective and lots of notes. But oh, you took notes. I took, I took notes, but not that many. Yeah, I took, well, yeah. <laughs> Well, you guys, I mean, personally for me, you guys were both very, very important people. You know, I mean, Toby, I, I saw your work ethic. I mean, you and Steve Lang, I mean, just constant, you know, yeah. constant models of that, even at a young age. And Steve, you were, I have said this so many times, there was one time I had a really bad audition and you were really honest. And I am grateful every day that you were really honest. <laughs> it wasn't fun at the time but but i i could not tell you enough times how thankful i am that it it stung the right way you know yeah. i hope you it know that right way. Way. Well, i hope you know what i mean by that I'm much, I'm much more skillful now than i was back then so. oh i i i enjoyed the i mean i didn't enjoy the roughness but it was it was what was needed <laughs> well, what, you know, the funny thing is, is that, um, you know, listening to the Bordoni, you know, buzz it three times, play it once. You know, you remember how many times I would say, you know, where are you with your music, with your ear training and music theory? And I would say, you know, go get your money back or, or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But the reality is, is, you know, buzzing, buzzing is brass soulfish. And yeah. You know, if you can really connect with the song with your lips and really teach your lips to sing as the old old school guys would do it, then it, it, it can really, really help. Uh, most people buzz too loud, though. Mm. You know, so but that's the only the other thing. But yeah, I mean, it's like there's lots of lots of ways to skin this cat. And, and I, I love your uh, perspective of, of open question and or living in the question and, and really staying this yeah. kind of um, eternal curiosity. Because of course, you know, I'm 20 years older than you guys. And, and as you get older, th that's really key, because of course, things will shift again. Yeah. You know, the, well, embouchure, the embouchure change actually <laughs> keeps on. Yeah. <laughs> that you know, I gotta. I have to point something out because there's something, and it's more. It's not to say anything more than staying in the question helped me, and it's it's somewhat to disagree with you, but like only in part. And I will tell you that that was something that I left out when Rocco told me to do this. He said to buzz as loud as as physically possible, and it worked until it didn't work. So, like, as long as you're in the question, you don't have an emotional attachment to a solution. It worked, in my opinion, it worked because I had, as you said earlier, a lot of physicality. And I needed that physicality to rest on breath support. And it's almost like I needed to overdo the solution to let go of the strength, right? But there came a time after about three months that it was hurting me more than it was helping me. Mm. So, like... Now, I think it's a gentle, like an easy buzz. That's what helps me the most. And as long as I'm not emotionally attached to the solution, it will help me as long as it needs to help me. As long as it helps. But like, <laughs> yeah, well, but like, as long as you're in the question, you're fine. But if you have like a sort of like a religious connection to the solution and it stops working, you might be screwed. Yeah. No, the, um, the, the only reason why I, 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 and the thing about it, you, you probably needed to buzz really loud to let, to, to kind of let go of that strength. That exactly you. my supposition. Right. And so that's where the, the greatest teachers that I've ever studied with, and I, you know, 
I, I have been a serial student. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Much in yeah. the same way that, um, you know, I don't know. Other, well, serious, I, other people are serial murderers, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they all taught each student differently. Uh, so Rocco would give somebody else something similar but different, you know, a different application. Right. The way, you know, all of the Schlossberg were a bunch of little, little, they were, they were like prescriptions that a doctor would write and go down to the druggist. You know, the, this is before, you know, there was a, a, an apothecary, go down to the druggist and have him mix up this potion, you know? Yeah. And that was the, th and that's what, that's it. And he would not give the same one to each student. And I think that's the key. And yeah, yeah the more we can reinforce the, the song part and let the wind be, uh, the, you know, the breathing gym, and not yeah. be the, not be the driving force. Because so many people walk around going wind and song, wind and song, and they they got things mm. backwards. They got it backwards. They got it backwards. But yeah, ah, that's well, really great, great to, to talk to you, young man. So yeah. nice. Are you yeah. using a clip-on microphone, or are you going right over your head? Uh, this is, uh, my lapel mic. It's a wireless lapel mic and I've got a, um, a nice Royer SF 24 V, uh, for my playing mic. And so I just, I hit the, whenever I have to play for a student, I'll mute. Yeah. Cool. And then I'm back. Yeah. That's cool. So you mute one and because and the Royer stays open all the time. Yeah, because the Royer's levels are set for trombone. So yeah. they're they're probably picking up my voice in the room, but not enough. Like you're hearing this probably as loud. Uh, but if I were to play with this on, it would spike the mic, right? Yeah. Uh, so this allows me with the Zoom software to give a pretty good representation of of a lesson remotely. Yeah. And are you wired uh, directly Ethernet, or are you using Wi-Fi? No, I I need to work on that. I am not. Uh, I'm doing wireless. I haven't run into a problem yet, but I know that would help me more. I don't know. You say it, it doesn't. It, it seems uh, you know. I haven't had a single glitch in the last hour and a half. So nice. Yeah. And I don't know if you know yeah. I've been glitching or not, but I mean I've I've got a, a Cat six, and some people uh. got a Cat eight. Ethernet cable, but it also oh, yeah. it also depends on you know who's delivering your your broadband. Yeah, that's well. I'm out in the boonies here, you know that uh, in Tanglewood, but that and I found that the I've got like a key light. Let me see this right there. Oh, uh, so so uh, I mean I actually do work kind of hard to frame the shot well. Yeah, so I, was you have watching, to... I was watching the soccer game in the background in the mirror. No, that's um. I forgot to turn off the TV. That's just Netflix <laughs> running its screen flavor. Yeah. No, I'm just oh. kidding. Yeah. Well, this is a sure microphone. Oh, nice. And that's it. That's it. That's it. I'm not as high. I've, I knew you would have the Royer ribbon mics. <laughs> well, get a, get, you do need a key light. That's not too hard. You got to get a, a breed what's that? Love. Breed Love's got the Neumann going. Neumann 87. Yeah. That's a, I've that's got a... some nice Neumanns, um, but those are cardioids, and they're a little like a little too cutting, a little too razor blade ish. Um, if I had them set up, I would probably put them as room mic, but I haven't had. I don't actually notice that Zoom is able to show that much subtlety yet. Yeah. So I I just made it kind of intimate with the Royer, like right there. Um, yeah, and do you do the original sound and that whole thing? Yeah, turn off original sound. Oh, you turn or turn on, on original sound, right. right. Yeah, sorry. And, and all the suppression and stuff you turn off, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. yeah. Shelby, is there a BSO uh, trombone section thing coming up? Anything like you just was just with the trumpets? Yes. It's going to be sometime in July. I don't know when they're going to put it out. There. It's going to be a YouTube thing. Uh, but we're all doing sort of mini recitals at the Learning Institute out here at Tanglewood. And, you know, social distance uh, rehearsals and concert to be broadcast later on. Uh, so they'll probably look for that in early August or late July. We're going to do a quartet recital 
with uh, the three trombones and Mike Broylance on tuba. So nice. uh, we've got a couple of commissions by African-American composers and uh, then the Debussy, Twash, and Songs. Um, a, a few other you, who pieces. Who did you I beg your pardon? Who did you commission? Oh, shoot. I knew you were going to ask me that. No, uh, I'm curious. No. Trevor West. No, no, no. I got this. I got this. I just don't have it memorized yet. Hang That's on. Okay. Hang on. Okay. I will tell you. Damn it, Steve. It's not recording anymore. <laughs> it's just we're live on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I can edit that uh, version. Well, we got to go look at it. Yeah, I should go back to your website here. Go back to the Facebook page and see if it's still here. And oh, man. Steve, what His about His name you? is Kevin. Who? His name is Kevin. I just need to get the last name because I really like the piece. Um, here it is. Uh, go ahead and move on. Move on. I'll, I'll get you. Oh, Hang I was going to ask, second. Steve, what about uh, Fulcrum Point? Do you guys have anything coming up with the online because of the corona? Um, so we do... Um, We've done. We've shifted all of our education stuff online. So we do uh, things via Zoom in uh, in the schools and in, in after school programs. And then uh, the third Wednesday of every month is a uh, a rebroadcast of former performances. Um, the next one is July fifteenth. Speaking of uh, African American composers, Ollie Wilson was, is a, he wrote an incredible piano trio. And so we'll have the piano trio on and um, a social activist from the Black Lives Matter movement and talking about um, basically what the classical world is doing about um, Kevin Young, was it? Kevin Day. Kevin and Chad Day. Hughes and Kevin Day. Hughes Just Kevin really Day. fantastic. Good to know. Um, uh, if you, if you, there's another guy you should check out. His name is Sean Lopebolo. He's here near Chicago uh, at Wheaton College. He just got a huge, um, I'm not sure if it's the Marine Band or Army Band, but just a big, big band comp um, thing. O-K-P-E-B-H-E-L-O, -O -O -E -E -O, And he writes really great music. Um, who else is there that uh, you should probably check into? Um, oh, you know Jesse Montgomery? She's a violinist in the public quartet. She's never written for brass, but I think it would be, she'd write really great stuff. Oh yeah? Yeah. You would know. Jesse Montgomery. Jesse okay. Montgomery. Great. Yeah, she's in New York. Um, yeah, there's, you know, it's been one of those things that we've been working on for about seven years. And then, you know, this whole thing blew up, you know, and rightly so. I mean, this goes along with what I was talking about in terms of global warming is that, you know, we as supposedly, you know, quest classical musicians, uh, you know, we really got to redefine what what that means. You know, what I call well, new there's art, so much what I call new tradition art that that needs to be like we we're we're absolving ourselves with passivity of past mistakes, and but there's like a tradition of there's a tradition that that needs to be changed. That's all. In right. Our perspectives. Well, then, and that's that's the com one of the conversations that we, that we've been, have been been having ongoing, which is you know. Before Toscanini, before the 1920s, before the recording industry, nobody played the music of two centuries before them. Right? When Mahler was, was conducting, he, he, they weren't programming Mozart and Beethoven. Yeah. They were all playing yeah, it, that's all new music. fascinating, but you're accurate there. They, they would program things that were of the day. Yeah. You're right. You're right. That's, they how we have, that's why we have so much great music from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century is that they were constantly, constantly writing new things. It's like that, you know, the, 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 the Beethoven, everybody goes, oh, Beethoven Fifth Symphony. You know, the Fifth Symphony and the Sixth Symphony were premiered on the same concert, along with the Choral Fantasy and the Fourth Piano Concerto. They did it in reverse order, though. And they did it in they did the reverse order. They did six and then five. That's, the reason it's significant is that it's the, that's the first one that, the fifth symphony is the first one that uses trombones, right? Right. Uh, at least a Beethoven, but he premiered at six and then five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was an eight hour concert and they said it was 45 degrees in, in the concert hall. <laughs> <laughs> that was in December, I think it was December 8th, 
you know, it was, they just had the 250th anniversary of it. And it was like, you know, they yeah. tried to recreate it. It was so freezing cold in the room and he just kept playing. And he also played, you know, he played, you know, sonatas and all kinds of things, improvisations, the whole thing went on forever. So, but you know, it wasn't like he was playing even Haydn or Bach. They studied it, right? To learn, we but like, they didn't. Oh, they didn't perform it as perform it. They no one would conceive of it. You know, it's like after he, they, they just wanted them. You know, they had to write a new one to make some money. So your point is, is that the programming, our current programming, needs to reflect a more modern vibe, anyway. Well, it just has to. We have to create the next generation the way that, you know, the way that Bach and Handel and Telemann created their generation. And then their kids did a, a generation of music that was lost, right? People kind of play CPE and Albert Hymne, but they really don't, you know? And then Haydn, Mozart, and early Beethoven created a generation of all kinds of new music, right? And then- But that Bach, beautiful thing came from them challenging the ears of the audiences, which is important and somehow lost essentially with, uh, you know, conservative program. I'm sure you would agree with like the conservative programming uh, is to like, facilitate more people coming back because they're hearing music that is familiar. An example with that would be Tchaikovsky 6. Everybody knows it and they like coming to hear it, Beethoven 5, Beethoven 9. People know this and it brings ticket goers in, but it's almost like audiences need to, need to at least have that hunger, a desire to come and hear, be challenged, have their ears challenged by modern composers. It's, it's not like it stops just with the orchestra, although I would say the lion's share of the, of the responsibility comes down to uh, the programming of the works, uh, you know, appropriate to facilitating the ears of the concert goer. Yeah. And no, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a tandem thing that goes on with, with education, right? And this is why musical literacy in the schools is essential. And this is where we need to be supporting STEM education and, and pushing for STEAM education. STEAM. Yeah. yeah. You know, and there is a movement behind it, but I think it really needs to be pushed just as we need to be able to go back. I mean, when I, when I was at Juilliard, we had improvisation at Juilliard for classical players. There was no jazz. And, you know, if you think about it, everybody knows about Beethoven and, and Bach being great, great improvisers and Mozart and everything else. But so were, Roman, so were Rachmaninoff and, and Prokofiev and Shostakovich and Chopin. And, you know, they were yeah. great improvisers. And as are com composers like Thierry Esquesh, you may, probably may not know, but... He's a French organist. Uh, Julian Wachner. That's another one. You should you should play some of his music. So Julian. He's yeah, but do you? So you're saying that that the the emphasis should be on the freshness of classical music rather than the the um, the things that we already know. Sort of like leaving audiences' ears unchallenged. It should be it should be the freshness constantly the freshness, and you know yeah. things should should be played for about. Well, for the life cycle of, 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 of people's curiosity, but people should be encouraged to, 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 to explore more. And we need to be every generation, you know, every generation has its adventurous composers and its conservative composers, right? Mozart was the adventurous composer, Hummel was the, was the conservative composer. Yeah. And, 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 and the same idea, you know, there were all kinds of composers around, around Haydn's time and Haydn was the one who was pushing all the limits and everybody else was working in the courts. They were kind of functional musicians. And just in the yeah. same way we have neo-romantic composers now and we have really, really, you know, expressionistic. And then we have some, you know, like complete noise music things. There's a fruit. Well, that... serialist composers, you know, neo-serialists. Yeah, I'm very... with you on that. Yeah, very, very few serialists anymore. But, you know, what I mean, there is, there's the complete spectrum of new music out there. So if we want it, you know, people commission Jim Stevens and, and, and Eric Eweisen all the time because they're looking for romantic sentiment. Yeah, so I'm that, with you on that. Cool. All right, do it. The, the reality is, you know, that the, the, the Albertis and the Salieri's and the Hummels of their time are not, you know, they, they were working musicians. And that people like their music, but the ones who were, you know, the ones who who challenged the form and challenged the harmony and challenged the everything else, they're the ones who live out through history. But if, yeah, it's so you have to support the entire package, or else, like between you know eighteen, 
1740 and 1870, sorry, 1740 and 1770, there was a bunch of shit being written. Well, people think C.P. Bach was right. Yeah, they, they, they people, yeah, things kind of lost their way because in a lot of ways they were, they were doing dumbed down version of the trailblazers that came the generation before. Um, but I mean, you said they are working musicians and I think that this is, this is indicative of the fact that it's, it's going to take the group, and I don't mean just the, just the composers, but also the programmers and the musicians themselves to sort of like develop the skills to be able to demonstrate, like give good, good representation of this new programming, but then also the concert goers as well, yeah. who like there's, they, a lot of people go to the orchestra because it makes them feel comforted to hear things that they've heard before, yeah. uh, but you need to actually absorb the possibility that your ears are going to be challenged, and that's the fun. Right. <laughs> you know, because right now we don't really have that latitude to, to take the risks, and that's, that's killing us in so many ways. I, I think, you know, I think the BSO takes more risks than most orchestras, and I think, you know, the, the programming that uh, Anders has really brought forth is really going to be amazing. And now, yeah. we're gonna, you know, this again, we're going to have a whole season of, of who knows what, you know, a little change. It's true, yeah. And it's going to be a reset button. Yeah, I think that's completely fair. Take advantage of it. And, and I hope that it is. I mean, it, I think that uh, we're going to be, I think in, in many ways, we're all going to be playing a lot of catch up. We got a lot of catching up to do, right? And it's, uh, you know, when we were planning these, uh, these new works, we were looking at, God, okay, so we have to do this on limited rehearsal. How are we going to, like, this is the trombone, uh, trombone section, the low brass section. We're like, we want to do this recital. It was like all these new works. You know what? We got to do this. We got to hustle. We got to learn this new stuff because we can't, we can't not. We, we get, and I think that's the thing is like to, to have that hunger, that curiosity, that aggressive desire to right. do new, more new challenging things. Is like it takes emotional strength as well as physical aptitude. We all got to show up. Welcome, we all got to hustle. Welcome to my world, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. it's so great to see you guys. See you guys Likewise. Too. Thanks to both yeah. of you for being here. And uh, yeah. We'll, Thanks for giving us an avenue to, to catch up. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you to say hello. Sometime we'll do it when it's not on Facebook. All right. That sounds good. <laughs> take, All right. Take, take, a run, take a run up October Mountain for me, would you? <laughs> All right. Sounds like a, a good plan. I'll see you later. Have a great night, guys. Thank you so much. Bye, guys.